There's this one joke from Family Guy that I've been obsessed with for years. We're a team and we've got to look out for each other, like Owl and Costello. I mean, the fella's name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base. Who? The guy on first base. Who? I'm asking you who's on first. Who? That's what I'm asking you. In fact, when I started this script, I was thinking, hmm, I feel like maybe I've written notes about this topic before. And after a quick search, turns out I had written some notes down when I first came up with the idea for this video on the 29th of November 2017, meaning that it's been six and a half years since I first thought, hmm, I should talk about that Owl and Costello joke in Family Guy. Anyway, the reason why I've been so obsessed with this joke is that it's very similar to this joke from The Simpsons. Well, Seymour, it seems we put together a baseball team, and I was wondering, who's on first? Yes. Not the pronoun, but rather a player with the unlikely name of who is on first. Now, I hope we're all in agreement that the Simpsons joke is just much better than the Family Guy joke. I will explain why I think it works better as a joke, but I'd like to start with the assumed agreement that the Family Guy joke is intuitively less funny. It's just unfunny in the way that shouldn't even need to be explained. But to try to offer a bit of substance, I'll point out what the basic essence of each joke is. For context, in case you weren't aware, both jokes are referencing an old Abbott and Costello routine. I'll start with the Simpsons joke as it has more to do with the actual substance of the original joke. See, the original joke starts with the premise that there's a baseball player called Who, and then the inevitable confusion from the person asking for the player's name extends from there. Now what I just did there, kind of awkwardly unpacking the joke, is basically what happens in the Simpsons clip. Principal Skinner awkwardly explains the joke, except in this case it's funny because he's supposed to instead be delivering the joke. The Family Guy joke, on the other hand, is more like, hey, Owl sounds a bit like Abbott, so what if the reason the other guy in the conversation was saying who was instead because he was an owl, and owls say who. But even if you don't agree with my surface level assessment of the quality of the jokes, I still feel there are some objective differences in how the jokes are structured that make one better than the other. Firstly, the Simpsons joke has more of a build up. Before this joke, there's almost two whole minutes of establishing that this is a teacher's talent show. We see several other members of staff perform, so we're already primed for the types of jokes we're likely to get. And then when the joke actually does arrive, the setup takes a little while as we hear Chalmers deliver his line before Seymour delivers the punchline. Compare this to the Family Guy clip, where the context is just one line from Stewie before we then get immediately thrust into the joke with the setup said incredibly quickly and before you've even registered anything, you've already arrived at the punchline. I think most people would agree that delivery matters with a joke and part of that delivery is properly pacing the joke out. And the fact that there's not much of a build up gets to the other issue, the cutaway format. I know South Park has already roasted the cutaway format for its role in detracting from the humor by removing a lot of jokes from the context of the episode's narrative. When I make jokes, they are inherent to a story. Deep, situational, and emotional jokes based on what is relevant and has a point, not just one random interchangeable joke after another. I personally think cutaway jokes can be pretty good, but I do think the cutaway format means there's less to appreciate in a joke. See, one reason why a joke can be good in a comedy is if it's intelligently built up to by the show's narrative. In general, most people appreciate a sense of discipline, where a show is willing to impose restrictions on itself. An example of a restriction would be that all jokes need to be set up by the narrative, and in appreciating a show working within that restriction, the joke is better. By way of analogy, think of how many times you're just hanging out with your friends and you're just laughing all the time. But it's not as if you're all world-class comedians delivering completely stellar material that would kill at an open mic. I think one reason for this is that any joke you hear in that context is likely something that just arises naturally in conversation. By contrast, if you saw that same level of humor in a scripted comedy show where you know the writers can literally dictate the flow of the conversation, you probably wouldn't find it as funny. Likewise, when comedy writers commit themselves to only telling jokes within the context of the episode, any joke they get out of it is automatically elevated by the impressiveness of how they incorporated that joke into the narrative. By contrast, the cutaway format allows the writers to make literally any joke at basically any time. The specific line that sets up the joke is, Chris, we're a team and we've got to look out for each other. And I'm sure in any given episode, there would be an opportunity to include that line. So it's not that impressive when it's incorporated into the episode. And within that context, it's reasonable to ask, okay, they could have had any joke in the world, 
They could have literally set up any joke here thanks to the cutaway format. And this is a scripted show, so they had quite a while to work on a joke. And this is the best they could come up with? Even if you don't find The Simpsons joke that funny, at least you can say they had this one opportunity to feature some faculty talent show themed humour, and they made the most of it. This Simpsons joke wouldn't be as funny if it was introduced with the line, This is as bad as that teacher's talent show we went to just forced into the dialogue of a completely unrelated episode, but it wasn't, so that makes it better. Now this being detached from the rest of the episode fits into my next important point, and it's probably my strongest point honestly, but I don't know how to structure YouTube videos properly, so I didn't start with my strongest point. The reason The Simpsons joke works better is because it's about characters we actually know. We know the characters of Skinner and Chalmers, Everybody's seen the steamed ham segment. No, I said steamed hams. That's what I call hamburgers. Skinner is always a bit awkward, and he's often trying to appease Chalmers in a way that usually only aggravates him. Chalmers is in turn, usually aggravated by Skinner, heavily critical of him, and usually disappointed by him. He's also awkward in his own way, being a high-ranking bureaucrat in a cynical education system. And the extension of knowing these two characters and having seen them interact all the time is that we know the dynamic between them, we've seen it play out before. So this joke would be much worse if it played out with any other pairing. Chalmers awkward delivery of the setup wouldn't feel the same coming from somebody else, and Skinner's complete inability to actually perform the bit wouldn't work either. And of course, even if one of these two was delivering their lines, it wouldn't work if they were delivering that line to a different character. Everything about this joke relies on the way it builds up the character humour. By contrast, we of course don't know Owl or Costello at all. At best you could say that we know the character of Costello because he's based on a real person. I mean, I guess you could also say we know the character of Owl since he's based on a real animal. But the point is that nobody is going to be sat down thinking, ah, that's a classic interaction between fan favourite characters Owl and Costello. What wacky adventures will they get into next? And I should point out that the joke in The Simpsons also has more layers. So far I've been acting as if the jokes in both episodes only amount to Skinner delivering a punchline wrong, and Al saying who to an exasperated Costello. The Simpsons joke starts off with the intrinsic awkwardness of Chalmers delivering his line in a very unnatural way. Then we get Skinner butchering the punchline, which is probably quite a relatable experience for a lot of people. I imagine we've all had that one punchline that didn't quite land. And then we get Chalmers' angry reaction to Skinner, where he also drives home how badly Skinner butchered the routine by saying they've only been on six seconds. Yes, well that's just great, Seymour. We've been out here six seconds, you've already managed to blow the routine. After this, Chalmers then walks off, muttering to himself that Skinner is a sexless freak. This works as shock humour, a representation of Chalmers' hatred for Skinner, and an accurate commentary about a funny aspect of Skinner's character. I am a virgin. <laughs> and of course Skinner is then left awkwardly on stage to drive home the cringe humour of the whole interaction. By contrast, Family Guy really only has one joke, which is then just repeated several times, as is the Family Guy way. There is one final addition, which is the line afterwards. Nothing will ever be funnier than misunderstandings. The issue I have with this is that it's actually mocking the source material by implying there is something reductive about the comedy of Abbott and Costello, which is quite mean-spirited to two legends of comedy. And it's absolutely brazen considering this is the quality of joke Family Guy is going to make before going after Abbott and Costello's comedy. And there's one final and very important distinction that needs to be made between these two jokes. One of these jokes still works even if you don't get the reference. See, being young and from the UK, I didn't know about Abbott and Costello. I do now as an adult, but I'm guaranteeing there are going to be a few people my age who don't know this reference. Thing is, the Simpsons joke still works even if you don't know the Abbott and Costello routine. In fact, I'd say that the character comedy is so strong that honestly knowing what the joke is referencing barely elevates the joke at all. It works almost just as well if it's just about Skinner and Chalmers failing to deliver a joke that was written specifically for that Simpsons episode. By contrast, if you don't get the reference in Family Guy, I can only imagine that you'd be left staring at the screen in complete confusion about what on earth was going on. 
And this, in my view, is the big difference between how The Simpsons and Family Guy do reference comedy, and why The Simpsons is so much better at it. Because with The Simpsons, you can often enjoy a moment even without understanding what's being referenced. Knowing the reference will add something, but it's often not necessary. By contrast, a lot of Family Guy jokes are rendered painfully unfunny if you don't get what's being referenced. And there's a few key reasons for this distinction. Really quickly, I do like to remind people that they can subscribe to see more of my content. A lot of people watch videos and don't subscribe, but it would really help me out if you did. Thank you. Firstly, often in The Simpsons, references exist as something in addition to the plot. Like, for example, the scene where Maggie hits Homer on the head in Season 2, and it plays the Psycho theme. If you didn't know what Psycho was, you could assume that the point is just that Maggie hits Homer on the head, and maybe it's referencing something, but that doesn't matter. It's important to the plot that Maggie hits Homer on the head, so it might as well happen with this extra reference on top. Or, okay, so credit where it's due, I actually decided to use a collider listicle for an example of some references, and this one even I didn't know about. Apparently the scene where Homer skips church and dances in his underwear is a reference to a movie called Risky Business. But I still enjoyed the scene without ever knowing that, because the main point is that Homer enjoys skipping church, which sets up his decision to cease going to church, which is the whole point of that episode. I could go on. One example that jumped out to me without having to consult a listicle is when Fat Tony's crew drive through Springfield and it plays the Sopranos theme. Obviously, you could probably infer it's referencing something, but even if you didn't know that, you can just view it as a cool scene showing a montage of Springfield. The point is that there are very few references in The Simpsons where I could imagine that somebody would be sat there in complete confusion, feeling like they're missing the whole joke. They might be aware they're probably missing something, but it's very rare that there's nothing else to laugh at. The contrast here is with Family Guy, where often the references take up the entire scene, and the point is the reference. Like one example, because I recently rewatched Amadeus, is this scene that's obviously referencing Amadeus. Play Peter Griffin. Ah, now that is a challenge. Go ahead, mock me. But it wasn't Stewie who was laughing at me. It was God! Now, I'm sorry, but I just can't imagine getting anything out of this scene if you don't know the reference. I mean, apart from just taking it as completely absurd, there's nothing else to appreciate. Why is Peter randomly asking Stewie to play his music? Peter isn't a composer, and why does it then cut to Peter talking to some random guy? See, this is a good example of how Family Guy often goes too far with their references, such that the reference becomes the whole point of the scene, and the joke becomes completely inaccessible if you don't get the reference. Maybe a subtler reference to Amadeus could work, maybe even just the first part of the scene would be fine, but to then include that extra bit of Peter talking to the priest takes the joke from that's kind of funny, but I feel there's something I'm missing, to okay, what the hell is this? And I do think that you can't just say, well, people should just get the reference. There are some pieces of media that are so iconic that you could probably say that everybody should have watched them, so the humour doesn't need to be accessible to those who haven't. But Best Picture Winner or not, Amadeus is still a three-hour film from 1984 about Mozart. I don't know how high it is on the average Family Guy fan's watch list. When a show is just filled with these types of references, I think it's fair to say it's asking too much of the audience in making it entirely necessary that they get the references. I'm not really including in any of this references where the show sets up the reference sufficiently within the context of the episode. One example would be the presence of Planet of the Apes in A Fish Called Selma. They make it pretty obvious they're referencing Planet of the Apes by explicitly referring to it several times, so if you want to choose to watch the film based on that, it's your choice. Although even in this case, the joke works perfectly fine even if you haven't seen Planet of the Apes, almost as if The Simpsons actually uses references as a launch pad for telling jokes instead of just having the references themselves be jokes. And one way that The Simpsons is able to avoid having the references themselves be jokes is this little trick. The Simpsons often references films and shows that aren't comedic. Just to limit myself to one example, let's take the diner scene in 22 short stories about Springfield that is obviously parodying the French McDonald's scene from Pulp Fiction. 
I mean, I realise that a lot of Tarantino's dialogue is slightly comedic, but I wouldn't describe any of his movies as comedies. And of course, because the film itself isn't a comedy, The Simpsons in parodying scenes from the film have to add the comedy to it. So you get jokes about how McDonald's must have sprung up overnight, because obviously in The Simpsons they don't have McDonald's. It's a bit of meta humour about how because The Simpsons tends to have their own version of things, it's funny to imagine they're confused by the existence of brands that are actually popular in the real world. And then of course there's this joke. Do they have crusty, partially gelatinated, non-dairy, gum-based beverages? Mm-hmm. They call them shakes. <laughs> shakes. You don't know what you're getting classic. And the point is that by taking a reference to a movie that isn't a comedy and making it comedic by adding jokes, those jokes are no longer dependent on understanding the original reference. And in this case it's so well done that I can almost guarantee that if somebody hasn't seen any clips from Pulp Fiction and you tell them this scene is a reference to a movie, they will be surprised to find that out. And I know this because I have a friend who likes The Simpsons, had never seen Pulp Fiction, and had no idea this was referencing a movie. All the jokes still work without needing to get the reference, and getting the reference just adds to the comedy. By contrast, Family Guy often parodies movies that are already comedies, which at that point means it's not exactly even a parody. You're not changing the tone of the original work, and you're barely even adding anything to it. It's sort of lazy. Like clearly Lyle Langley in Marge vs. the Monorail is a parody of Harold Hill from The Music Man, but when he sings his iconic song to win the crowd over, that's a wholly original song. It took talent to come up with the melody and write the lyrics. Conan O'Brien wrote this episode, and he should be really proud of it. By contrast in Family Guy, one time they thought, hey, what if… What if Peter just Now a woman who kiss on a very first date is usually a hussy sang the song Shapoopy. Now a woman who kiss on a very first date is usually a hussy. Like the exact same tune. And a woman who kiss on a second time out is anything but fussy. The exact same lyrics. And a woman who kiss on a second time out is anything but fussy. Basically just copied it. But a woman who wait till a third time around. Head, head in the clouds, feet on the ground. She's, she's the girl he's glad he's found. She's his shapoopy. The only difference with Family Guy is that Peter basically sings a random show tune as an exaggerated example of his showboating, while in the actual movie this song is like, part of the narrative. Which if anything makes Family Guy just recreating this song even more lazy, because they didn't even bother to come up with some elaborate scenario to justify its use. Honestly, when you reference movies and shows that are already pretty comedic, sometimes it comes across as basically just stealing. Like, here's a good example. Let's say you saw this joke. Calm down, get a hold of yourself. Here Brian, let me handle this. Calm down, everything's gonna be alright. Chris, you're wanted on the phone. Everything's gonna be alright. You might watch it and think, ha, huh, the Family Guy writing staff wrote a funny joke into this episode. You would just assume this is their joke. So then later on, when you watch Airplane, it's hard not to think, wait a minute, Family Guy just stole this joke. I'm sure if you saw Airplane beforehand, you probably just think of it as a reference. But the fact of the matter is, there's no indication this is referencing something. If you just went into this episode without having seen Airplane, you would just assume that this joke was written by the Family Guy writing staff. You know, the way that usually a joke would end up in a comedic show. The people working on the show would write it. So when you find out that actually they just copied this joke from something that was already a comedy, and they literally didn't do anything to change the substance of the joke, that leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. I can't enjoy this joke anymore, because I originally enjoyed it on the assumption it was a Family Guy joke, but now I know it's just a joke that Family Guy referenced. I use the term reference there loosely because referencing is a dangerous game if you're not making it clear that you're referencing something and you're not really changing the substance of the original joke. Like take for example what I'm doing here in reviewing media. Imagine if you'd never heard of CinemaSins. If I started making fun of the idea of nitpicking a movie, and I then began giving examples of stupid nitpicks and added a little ding noise with a sin counter in the corner, you could probably work out that I'm parodying something. 
But if I just started pointing out problems with a movie, and I punctuated these problems with a ding noise and used a sin counter, at that point you wouldn't think I was parodying something, you'd rightly assume that I was introducing my own format that I came up with. So if you later found out about cinema sins, you'd think, oh, so KC Reviews just stole that. So not only does Family Guy fail to do reference comedy in a way that's funny, but arguably when you look at how they reference other comedies, you sort of have to question the ethics of what they're doing. I'm quite comfortable saying The Simpsons really isn't guilty of this, because The Simpsons almost always adds jokes to anything they're referencing, and this is why they often don't even reference comedies. And uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all my thoughts on how The Simpsons and Family Guy do reference humour, and why in my view The Simpsons is way better at it. Also, okay, like and subscribe and everything, but really quick, while we're on the subject of references in Family Guy, so there's one example I can think of where not knowing the reference actually made the joke better. Weirdly though, it's not a reference to a movie or TV show, it's a reference to a real life phenomenon. So in the classic episode Da Boom, where they're in a post-apocalypse, there's a scene where Tom and Diane are cannibalizing Patricia Takanawa, and Peter says this. That's crazy! They're just gonna be hungry again in an hour. Now here's the God's honest truth. It wasn't until years later that I found out that apparently Chinese food is supposed to not keep you full for very long. And it's not that I hadn't eaten Chinese food, I've eaten lots of Chinese food, it just keeps me feeling full for about as long as literally any other type of food would. If anything, because I like Chinese food and I eat a lot of it, it keeps me full for longer. The last time I ate Chinese food, I ate so much of it that I was full to the point of physical discomfort for hours after eating it. Usually I have a snack around 9.30 before I clean my teeth and head to bed. I didn't even have a snack that evening, and I ate at like 6pm. So I don't know where this idea is coming from that Chinese food doesn't fill you up very long. It definitely wasn't on my radar as an obvious target for observational comedy back when I watched this episode. But the thing is, when I first saw this joke, I thought it was really funny, because I thought the joke was just that in general, when you eat a meal, it's not going to keep you full for that long. Like most people eat three meals a day and have snacks in between. So if they ate Trisha Takanawa, they would get hungry again eventually. And I just thought this was a joke about Peter being completely unfazed by cannibalism. Like I thought that was pretty funny. The idea that you'd see people doing such a disturbing taboo thing and just say, eh, but is it really worth it? I mean, you're just gonna get hungry again. To me, that's funny in an absurdist sort of way. But now I know that the joke is supposed to be that apparently Chinese food doesn't fill you up very much, and I don't really find the joke funny anymore. That's not a piece of observational humour I can relate to. And I mean, apart from anything else, she's Japanese.